Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making, and now they're applying that same obsession to professional grade artist panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. Holly Lane is my guest today. Holly's work is as much about the painting as it is about her frames. Her frames are an extension, an elaboration on her painting. She started thinking that frames could be more than just an enclosure or protection for a painting during her undergrad years at San Jose State University. Holly's first clues came from the way the borders of illuminated manuscripts added dimension to early texts, and she has been elaborating on that theme ever since. She began creating her own frames, intricate housings for her paintings, which often have doors that open to reveal the paintings within. She designs her frames along with the paintings, sometimes coming up with the frame first and allowing that to dictate her painting. She selects the wood, presses it, and carves it in her studio and workshop in California. In this episode, Holly talks about her process, how she chooses her subject matter, and some of the interesting responses that she's had to her work over the years. Holly Lane is represented by the Forum Gallery in New York. Here is Holly Lane. Holly, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I am very curious about about your artwork and how you got into the whole framing aspect of it, because your framing is as much, if not, it seems sometimes more of a part of the piece than than not. Can you talk a little bit about that piece of your art? While I was an undergraduate in painting, I began to think about frames. At that time, if a painting had a frame at all, it was just a thin line that served as a protection for the canvas like a dividing line that all that was within the frame was art and all that was outside the frame was not art. A good frame was supposed to be inconspicuous. I have done two years of philosophy before I switched to an art major. So I was also thinking about the practical, pondering the nature of frames, the practical part and the philosophical meaning of frames. So at that time, I found some illuminated manuscripts in the university library and saw how the borders visually commented on the text, Mm -hmm. sometimes even spoofing the text, like like a knight riding a snail or a monkey displaying its rear end toward the text. (laughs) Yes, some of them are really comical. (laughs) So from that discovery, I realized It was like my epiphany moment that I realized that a frame could be many things. It could be an informing context. It could extend movement. It could be a conceptual or a formal elaboration on the painting. It could embody ancillary ideas. It could be like a house that expresses the mind, that houses and expresses the mind, and many other rich permutations. And from that point on, I began to create pieces that fused frame and painting with some pieces having doors that open and close over the paintings to suggest contingency, potentiality, the future, the past, or cause and effect. And spatially speaking, I think of the space in a painting as mind space because we project our minds into the pictorial space. So I see that as mind space. But the Spatial qualities of sculpture exist in our own physical space. We walk around it, proportion our bodies to it, Mm -hmm. and in a way it's apprehended or seen by the body. So by fusing sculptural frames with pictorial images, I hope to engage both those aspects of aesthetic experience, the mind space and the body space. Yeah. And they also, I mean, just looking at them, they they invite engagement. It's not enough for me to just see a picture of your work. I want to go in and touch it and open and close all the doors. <laughs> and you know, It's really remarkable. Yeah. 
one museum show I was in, they had they had put a guard next to it because people were fiddling with the doors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. You, it would be hard to control yourself in that situation because they are. I'm glad that happens. <laughs> I'm, glad, yeah. I'm glad people feel invited into the work, but I wouldn't want anybody to break it. You know? That too. <laughs> now, do you, how do you, I have so many questions about your work. So I'll, I'll try to like keep it to one question at a time so I don't barrage you. I'm sure this is the obvious question you probably get asked a lot, but do you carve your own frames? How do you conceive of these and create them? Yeah, I do all the carving myself. I got my MFA in painting, had one semester of 3D design, you know, undergraduate, the regular stuff, but pretty much self-taught from books and scrutinizing and trial and error and bandages on the fingers sort of stuff. I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. So that was pretty much self-taught. And what I do is have in my sketchbook simultaneous ideas for frames and ideas for paintings. And then a painting may drive the process. And then I go from the painting to the frame, but it's usually start out with the frame, design a frame, and I have so many painting ideas. And then I go back and forth in the sketchbook to get the frame that best extrapolates on what's going on in the painting. So they speak to each other or One's a foil for the other or such like that. So that's what happens there. And then I start out by making the frame, usually make the frame first most of the time. And that takes probably two thirds of the time. It takes longer to make the frames than it does to paint because paint is really nimble and quick after the carving because carving takes a long time. (laughs) I imagine. And and they're so intricate. Yeah. And I have a process where I laminate pieces. I don't start out with a big block because that has inherent tensions in the wood because the tree grows in rings and mm-hmm. it has the tree also has like a twist. You can't see it, not with palm trees, but other trees, there's a twist in the wood that comes up out of the soil and there's slight little twist comes up. Even redwoods have it, this twist. So there's these tensions that are in the wood. And if you have a big block of wood and you cut it, cut it out, you can cut it a certain way. So you relieve some of that tension, but often the tension's still there in the wood and it cracks over time. So I have, I laminate pieces together under pressure and that takes a lot of time for the adhesives to dry. But the, once it's done right, the joint is stronger than the wood. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So that's why it takes a long time to do the wood part because it's also I'm waiting for stuff to dry. (laughs) Yes. I would imagine just from the design standpoint and and seeing how these these frames are because they're almost like I hope this isn't like part of me like that joyful part of you when you look at something and it recalls a childhood thing like part of me it's like oh, they're like little doll houses I just oh, want right. to open you know they're not they're much more beautiful than any doll house I ever could have imagined when I was a kid and and I hope that's not an insult to compare it to a doll house but it does sort of make you you just want to like go into it and look and and get deeply involved in all the little details that you have carved in there. I've had people say that my work looked like the love child of Joseph Cornell and Louise Nevelson. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not too bad. That's not too bad. The Cornell did those little boxes and stuff that you could enter. So I, I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear a little bit more about how you conceptualize these. If it's possible, can you take me through a little bit like what happens in your sketchbook and how do you choose the motif and then move on into actually, I wanted to say it's, I can't say painting it. It feels like more you're, you're building and constructing this event almost. (laughs) Yeah. Well, in my sketchbook, there are little vignettes, a lot of vignettes of things like sometimes It'll be the contour of a cupcake or something that I'm enamored with, something round. And there'll be all these little things that come together and coalesce into something that's metaphorical or a message or something. But sometimes I don't, it's all pretty intuitive and I don't 
really understand what the iconography is or the sources were until I'm done with the work and then it all comes together. But then I orchestrate that when I get about three or four elements that I really have to put into a work of art and that I can orchestrate them together and kind of leave it out what it all means at the beginning. I don't really know what it means until the end. And then, so I put that together, the shapes together, and it comes out. And the stuff how it comes out at the end, I have like a couple of themes that my work keeps returning to. And they're like interspecies compassion, mm. philosophical proofs of that animals can think and those are like where an animal corrects its errors or it fakes something pretense uh-huh. or they have an awareness of other minds. So I'll, I'll have that in the work. And I also have a little subset or I rethink the implications, the backstory behind myths and stuff. So I've done a couple on the goddess Fortuna. It's a Roman goddess of fate and destiny and luck and chance. And she was considered to be capricious, lavishing favor on some, and then meeting out disaster on others. And I always wonder, like, why was Fortuna so random and capricious? So I was trying to think of the backstory, and it all must have, I decided, must have been due to the fact she had some early career disappointments. (laughs) (laughs) So I've done a couple of pieces of things going very wrong for the dear young Fortuna. You know? <laughs> what, 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 give me an example of, I love this, because when I was a kid, I loved mythology so much. I was just kind of obsessed with it. Give me an example of how Fortuna's career might have gone just horribly awry. <laughs> so the latest one I did was called Fortuna's First Assignment. <laughs> So her first assignment, she's sitting out, it's a vast field with stormy clouds in the background with all these rocks in the field, and she's sitting on a rock, and all around her are golden crowns, stacks of golden crowns, and big golden keys that will open doors, and she's sitting there waiting for for applicants, but <laughs> nobody has come. <laughs> she's sitting there, and the wind's blowing, and her hands are kind of twitching, and this and that, and she's looking a little annoyed. So her first big show, nobody came. <laughs> so that was her first big disappointment. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> so then, it sort of follows that she would be a little bit harder on the the kings and the and the. <laughs> Well, it's just not showing up <laughs> to be crowned. And it's just, well, if people aren't going to come to my party, I just might be picky about who I'm going to give it to. And I might not, if people give me offerings, I might not care. It might not work. You know? mm-hmm. because, <laughs> and then for the frame, I have, it's like a little shelf right in the front of the painting that comes out kind of like a teller shelf when you go into a bank. So it's like a place where you can go in, solicit from her, but she's, Things aren't happening for her at the moment. Yeah. And then at the top, there's like a vessel form with a lid for things that are stored and hidden like treasures. And then on the sides are like two blue little strips that are angled. And it's like the zenith of the sky. That's where she is watching things. Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) And I love how you're, you're mixing sort of modern elements like the bank teller window with the mythological elements. Yeah. (laughs) Then I also like to, because I'm a woman artist and I studied a lot of art history. I had, oh, like I took, uh, while I was doing studio courses, I took about 33 units of art history from Roman to contemporary. So I could see that women weren't given an opportunity to do art like men did in the past. So Mm. we're really fortunate now we can get an education and study from a nude model. So one of my other like subsets that I do in the work is to represent women from a woman's point of view. So they're usually problem solving and they're doing stuff and they're instead of just laying about looking beautiful. <laughs> right. Because that's what I do all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm usually posed like Venus on the couch, but no, I'm kidding. Yeah, with a little pootie floating around feeding your grapes and stuff. Yes, (laughs) peeled grapes. That has never happened to me. (laughs) I I keep waiting. So that was, and 
then I also kind of a nature mysticism I have in some of the work in the echo psychology, where echo psychology is that we're not their basic premises since we evolved in nature, and it's only been the last a thousand years out of our fifty thousand years of evolution, or <laughs> three hundred thousand that we've been in cities that our real home and our sense of naturalness is being in nature and that that we get overstressed because we're in the city so much. Yes. There's actually echo psychology therapy where you go out and camp. <laughs> I've heard of this and that that it's actually, you know, in the same way that we need sunlight, we need to be in in kind of the greenery or nature and I've read some studies about what the effects of going for a walk in nature, particularly like in trees, and the physical effects that that has on your brain and your stress levels and your relaxation and ability to think. It's therapy, it really is. <laughs> so I'd like to include that in my work too. Interesting. As a theme, yeah. I'm curious, can you, let's go back a little bit. When you first started becoming interested in all... I'm imagining, and you can you can tell me if this is correct or not, that you had all these varied interests in philosophy and in art history and in illuminated manuscripts, and they all sort of coalesced into into what you're doing. But do you remember, like, when you you know, for example, when you got out of school? Because it's one thing to be in school where you are. It's you're kind of allowed to <laughs> to play, I guess, a little bit. I mean, you need to have. Obviously, you're staying within the undergrad or graduate philosophy that they're they're teaching you, but you have a lot of room to just play without any worrying about anything else. <laughs> and then when you when you get out well, in some sense, and when you get out of school, then it's kind of like you don't have all those safety nets and all that support system is is somewhat gone. So I'm curious because your art is so distinct from the normal path, I would say. Yeah. I'm curious, like, once once you got out of school, did you struggle with that at all? Were you questioning what you were doing? What was that like for you? Well, when I was in school, I started working with the carved frames. So I was doing that already. I was doing that while I was in school, and I was the oddball in all the critiques. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go, now we're coming to Holly's work. Right. <laughs> like, what do we say about this? He just, everybody was really kind. And even the for their BFA candidacy, MFA candidacy and that, the art history professors could come in and vote for the studio stuff, but they usually didn't because they're too busy with their their own art history student stuff. Mm -hmm. But the art history department, this whole bunch of them came in and voted for my work because they said, don't change her. Don't try to change her. Don't try to. They wanted me to feel supported. Yeah. With that. And then so I felt really supported in school. I was surprised by that. That's, <laughs> that is wonderful, yeah. though. I have to yeah. say that, that that's beautiful that that happened. I love it. Yeah, I was really surprised. My, the head of my committee came in and said, Holly, Holly, the art history department chair couldn't make it to the voting like they never do so they wrote on really big on the chalkboard i vote for holly lane <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> when all the studio professors came in that's you know just blazed like neon to them and they're going like what dr goggler is voting what that was really nice yeah it was really nice yeah it was really nice so but so before i graduated i decided at least send your get your portfolio out to San Francisco or, or, of course, New York is the ideal, but at least get it out of town and into into San Francisco or Chicago or LA or something like that. So, And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for people who don't know, can, where did you go to school? San Jose State right. University in San Jose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I started out in a community college in Cuesta College in San Luis Obispo and then transferred to San Jose State. Got my BFA there and my MFA there. It's a really big art department. So if you, anybody can find a mentor, if you want to do realism, you can find a mentor to do that. If you want to do conceptual, you can find a mentor to do that. It's a really big art department. So it was really helpful that way. So about a couple months before I graduated with my MFA, I sent my slides. It was slides then. Mm -hmm. up to San, to San Francisco, and I got eight offers. Wow. Eight 
I just was blown away because I was expecting to get five years of rejections. That's what they said. Five years of rejection because galleries think you're over-influenced by your professors and they want to wait for you to get toughened up and find your own path and all that. But I got eight offers and I didn't know how to pick. How do I pick between the best of the best? I didn't know. What a great problem to have. <laughs> so what did you what did you do? I got spoiled rotten from the start. You know? <laughs> so I, I visited the galleries and I picked the gallery that had the dog in it. <laughs> well, that actually makes total sense given some of your yeah, work. Because yeah. I thought, well, they must be good people because they have this dog. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it turned out to be a really good choice anyway, even though I'm sure all the other ones would have been wonderful too. <laughs> you have to pick one. Right. <laughs> so that I had a show on the calendar when I graduated. So, you know, I was just happy times. And then just a couple of months after graduating, I had a solo show there and Alice Bingham of Schmidt Bingham Gallery in New York saw my work and long story short, she offered me representation. Mm -hmm. And she called me up and talked with me a long time about the philosophy of the gallery and all that. And I hung up and I thought, wow, what a dream come true. And it, it was a dream come true. <laughs> was with them for 12 years until they closed after 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. But before they closed, they showed my work to other galleries in New York and Forum Gallery picked up my work. So I've been showing with Forum Gallery, 15 years, so a total of 27 years now showing in New York. Yeah, so I, I've been lucky, but it doesn't mean I haven't gotten rejections. <laughs> it started out really good. So that really good, great first start made me into like a thinking it was all going to be easy street. But I've learned since then it's not. <laughs> There's lots of other rejections come in. For, yeah. Fortuna has been, yeah. has been casting her one. I figured I had enough. It's going to give me one one good happy time, and the rest of it I was going to have to plow through like all, all the other artists in the world. <laughs> so I've had tasted both of them, the euphoric out-of-the-box thing and the humiliation of rejection for grants and things like that collectors buying work and then returning it because they said once they got it home it was too disturbing <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah which can make you feel proud <laughs> as well as a little a little bummed but yeah I'm sorry it didn't go with your couch <laughs> <laughs> but that was the disturbing part I don't know they never explained my dealer was just so apologetic but all kinds, every artist, all the stuff every artist has to go through. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't think I've ever talked with anyone about that particular type of disappointment of having your work, <laughs> your work returned. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. It sold to somebody else later. So that was fine. And she, that collector has some of my work and has like three of my pieces. So it went to a good home. So I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. Hi, I'm Sean Cheatham, and I'm part of the Trakel Pro team. You may remember Sean from an interview last year on the podcast. He's a California artist who paints just these gorgeous portraits and figurative works. So aside from the quality of their brushes, I asked Sean what else stands out about Trakel Art Supplies. I love that they're made in California. That's to me something that's nice. You just If you order it through their website, they're such a small company that they're very personable and, and you may end up, if you call, you'll be talking to Courtney maybe or whoever. and. The brushes will show up very quickly. Sean teaches workshops in Rome every summer. And last year, he needed supplies from Trapel. They're making it easy for people. And they ship internationally. When they ship to Rome, I had a big shipment, and it was, like, pretty quick. So what stands out about Trapel Art Supplies? Made locally, 
more affordable and more durable. I mean, I can't can't really beat that. And I don't. I'm not just saying that because I'm on the protein. I was enjoying them before that. It's funny too because now I actually take better care of my brushes. When I used to use the other brands, I would actually just treat them like disposable brushes. And every time I went to a store, I just buy a few brushes because I knew I was just going to beat them up and start new ones every time. But I don't do that anymore. Kind of weird how that happens. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code Savvy16 to get 15% off your next order. I'm curious, like when you when you talk about some of those issues of like grants and getting grants and getting rejected for grants, I'm trying to remember now off of the top of my head, so which means I'm probably going to get this completely wrong. But I think there's like some statistic that for grants, you you can probably like expect like 25% success rate. Is that? Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's really good. <laughs> so that's a little bit high. <laughs> yeah, that's I I think that's high. Okay. So just out of curiosity, what is your take on that? If I can ask you that from your experience, some of the earlier artists might have the expectations like, well, okay, if I send out... X number of grant proposals, then I'll get X number back. And I don't know that that's actually true. So I'm kind of curious, like from your standpoint, what's been your experience with that? It's about 10%. Mm -hmm. Nine out of 10 times, you get the Dear John letter Uh and that we regret to inform you. (laughs) I'm saving them. <laughs> you know what? I re- I have this. Um, it's from galleries, though. But there was oh, an artist. Galleries too. Yeah, there was an artist who saved all of his rejection letters and made it into a book. And you know, and he drew all over oh. them and stuff. And it's really funny. It's just like one of those oh. like <laughs> silly little books, but it's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's like what artists sit on the porch and sip their wine or their beer or whatever in the rocking chairs and talk to each other about about horrors yeah (laughs) (laughs) he made a show out of it that's great (laughs) right yeah it was it's a great book I think that was remember I I have I can see it now on my bookshelf but I can't go grab it but yeah I think it was John Natsoulis gallery in in Davis had that I went there and and was talking once with John and he told me about this book and he had it I'm like I need to have this book (laughs) 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 like you have commiserate well you know I mean it's it there's something really refreshing about it and and I think also that's part of the the conversations that I have with artists on on this this podcast is that that's just part of that's just part of the deal yeah yeah you got got to develop a thick skin yeah thick skin and kind of this almost delusional optimism to keep trying and keep going back and carrying on and having fortitude yet yeah it's being an artist is not for the the faint of heart (laughs) (laughs) yeah I think that we have this I don't know what adjective to put in front of it, but this like insane stubbornness and, you know, we're like a dog with a bone that's just like, you're not, we might drop the bone and walk away from it for a second. But if you come near that bone, (laughs) you know, know how dogs do that. (laughs) They're like, I'm not interested in in that anymore until you think somebody might try to take it away. And then you double down. (laughs) I had a dog that would growl at flies that came near his bone. (laughs) I think my husband's like that with his food, too. (laughs) Cute. (laughs) That's so funny. So I'm curious, from your work, this is a question I like asking, and I would love to hear your answer to this. What memorable responses have you had to your work? A couple. One one show in New York City was a solo show, was at the opening, and I could see in how people are talking and all people are talking and come up to you and talk and all that. I could see in the background there was a person there that looked kind of disturbed and kind of hovering in the background like she wanted to say something. So when the crowd thinned, she approached me and she said, she asked me the question, are you married? <laughs> Which I kind of thought I didn't know quite at first set me back because I didn't know where this was leading to <laughs> right but that's not really an art question but anyway you know, huh. you know. yeah I'd be like where is this going so I said yes and then she throws back her head and goes ah 
and says in a condescending tone, your husband makes the frames for you. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, all the bleeding I've done and all that, I wasn't going to going to sit there and nod and smile about that. I said, no, I make the frames myself. And then to give her an evidence-based fact there, I, I gave her an explanation of something that only somebody who worked with wood would know. Uh-huh. Black walnut, the wood black walnut, when you put it through the scroll saw, the friction from the saw makes the wood release this rich, spicy fragrance. Mm. Only somebody who actually worked with wood would know that. And so her face darkened again, and she stood there a while and then stalked away. (laughs) (laughs) I would just, (laughs) I kind of assume that you made your own frames. Like, I don't know how you could outsource that. Like how, as an artist, you would be capable of letting somebody else do that, that is so important to your work. Yeah. And and who would take the time to do that unless they were so invested in it? Yeah. And another really great one on the positive one was one that everybody, any artist would hope for, would dream of, would think was the bee's knees. And it was somebody reacted with this, a Stendhal syndrome. Have you heard of the Stendhal syndrome? No. Okay. It's Stendhal was somebody, it's like a psychological syndrome in front of great art. Some people will cry. I didn't know there was a word for that. I love it. Yeah, it's Stendhal syndrome or the Florence syndrome or the Paris syndrome or something like that. Stendhal was the guy that named it, yet crying like Sigmund Freud fainted in front of Michelangelo's Moses. I haven't heard that story either. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Besides the car frame pieces, I've started doing these gilded sculptures to see if I could make the sculpture with as much iconography and narrative and message as the painting. So I do that. So it was one of those sculptures. And the person like walked into the room, gasped, put the hand to the chest and started crying. <laughs> oh my gosh. How... And, I was, and I almost started crying too, because I was that I could be there and see that. Yeah, yeah That was like the best tribute any artist could witness. Absolutely. Wow. That's it. That's incredible. I mean, I've had experiences where I've walked into a museum and I, yeah, I don't know how to describe it, but you, I have a visceral physical yeah. reaction and the closest description I can, <laughs> I can, and it sounds awful, but the closest parallel that I felt before is just like the almost going into shock, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, that it's dizziness and fainting and, and yeah, and there's like and this trembling. Some people tremble. Yep, yeah. yep. And there's almost like this. It feels like your heart stops, and then there's a surge of I, adrenaline that you're just yes, kind of buzzing. Yeah. And yeah, and so it's kind of like I mean, I've been in I've been in two pretty relatively serious car accidents, and 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 it's that it's such a horrible thing to compare it to, but <laughs> but it is that sensation of like there's a uh, time stops. And then everything yeah. rushes to catch up. Yes, yes. Well, well, I'm sorry you got in those two car accidents, <laughs> but you at least have like a watermark yes. to compare it with, because that's like a, a peak experience to have that with art. Yes. Yeah. And that you got to witness it. Like, usually yeah, the artist doesn't get to witness it. That's so really? special. Yeah, that, that was a gift. Yeah. I think the first time I had, I experienced that in front of a painting, is like, burst into tears in front of Arnold Blockland's The Isle of the Dead at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I was just, I've seen it in books and all that. I didn't, I had no idea it would move me so much, but it did. And then I was like trying to hide myself yes. from people who see me blubbering right <laughs> there, you know. <laughs> and Edvard Monk in that was that MoMA who did that to me, you know, and again, I'm going, okay, here we go again. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I just take Kleenex with me when I go to museums. You know? Yeah. And it's usually completely, completely unexpected. I, exactly. yeah, I had that experience. I literally had to, I had that experience at the, at the Arm and Hammer Museum in, in California near UCLA. And it was a Kara Walker exhibition. And I didn't, I I went in and I, 
I knew about her work, but obviously not enough. And I was, I had to go to the bathroom and compose myself. Like I just started <laughs> crying and like, <laughs> and I had to go, I felt like, so it was such a weird sensation because it wasn't, I wasn't prepared for it. I was not expecting it. And I literally had to go find a quiet place and kind of like compose, not kind of, but compose myself. And so I could go back out and see the rest of the exhibition. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I bet she'd love to hear that happen. That response happened to her work. I bet she'd love to hear that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, okay. Now we've bonded over weeping over pain. <laughs> <laughs> About having these emotional, yeah. yeah that's yeah. so amazing. I'm curious, you know, because you mentioned illuminated manuscripts, is that something that you go back to? Is that something that still informs your work? Not as much from that initial concept of how the, the border can be related to the frame, to the text, or to, to the inner world. But I I do love the intimacy of the manuscripts in the books. And it hadn't occurred to me that maybe that the smallness and the intimacy of the manuscripts that are in the little handbook sized, like the hours and stuff, mm -hmm. That might be related to, because I, I like making the work small and the doors on the work. That might have been an unconscious influence for what I'm doing now. Okay, so first question, do you ever get kind of stuck when you're in your studio? And do you look at other artists if that happens? Oh, yeah, I look at a lot of, a lot of art. I have a, a very, because of my philosophy background, I think every style and ism can teach us something about the nature of art. And my first introduction to museum art, I was captivated by a, a George Innes painting and a, a minimalist painting, two big spectrums of difference and difference between the two. So I like to look at all different kinds of arts. I have art books and like to lay in bed and thumb through books of Klimt or Vermeer or Northern Renaissance or Rothko or just O'Keefe, mm. just all over, all over the place. Like I think of the art world as this big smorgasbord and I've got my empty tray and I'm just going down, filling up, <laughs> filling up with everything I can. <laughs> Cheesecake. You know, Cheesecake. Yellow. Yeah. <laughs> more cheesecake you know, and stuff right going back I, for seconds and I, thirds and <laughs> yeah, really. yeah I mean artists through their own artwork are the most patient teachers if we look closely and they're our most patient and teachers to each other you know I mean mathematicians learn math from mathematicians. Engineers learn engineering from engineers. Musicians learn from musicians. Artists learn from artists. Right. So, yeah. Is there any artists that people might be surprised to hear that you go to? Because it sounds like you have a very eclectic interest. And I'm kind of curious when you're looking at all these different artists. I can sort of answer this for myself, like when I go to other artists to look to when I'm stuck on something, or I just want to be inspired by something. But I'm kind of curious for you, like, what are some of the things, who are the artists? And what are some of the things that you pull from them that goes into your own work? That wouldn't be expected or unexpected? Yeah, that may be. I mean, because I think like, so for example, if I'm a landscape painter, there's sort of like the traditional people that you would expect me to answer with. Yeah. Well, I always go back to Mark Rothko, the abstract painter. Mm -hmm. His work's so engulfing and has a sense of atmosphere and mysticism to it. Yes. Like you, you can enter into that work and the edges are soft and there's this kind of mysticism to it that is so oh, welcoming to me. And the color, his color choices. Yeah. If I, go back to his work. Yeah. And then there's lots of other things I look at too, like I look at architecture and furniture. I'll, go, I'll look at furniture and especially like ecclesiastical furniture, like the staffs. Mm. Staffs. And there's these chairs that are for prayer that have little teeny stubby legs and a big tall back. Uh -huh. But just ecclesiastical furniture is fascinating too. So that Look at that. 
kind of thing too, as well as as well as paintings. Yeah, because there's so much symbolism in that, and yeah. and in some cases a certain amount of storytelling, but also yeah, that's really interesting. That's really interesting because I know at least like you know within the Catholic tradition, there's a lot of the design of it is oftentimes trying to or getting people to put themselves in a, in a literal position before God. Yeah. 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 That I can totally see that. That's fascinating. And the Rothko reference, like what I find interesting about that is that his, his work to me, and I don't, you know, I've seen pictures of your work, but I haven't seen it in, in person, but your work to me feels like it, again, it's that invitation to a sort of an intimate exploratory experience yeah, that's what I hope for. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> and then his is like a different type of that because it's the scale is so much different. Yeah, it's so huge. Yeah, yeah. You get immersed in it. Like you could get lost in those paintings. Yeah, I kind of like the idea of it because it's small. It, it's like a keyhole mm-hmm. experience where you get small to become large. Yes, It's a little bit in a weird way. And I'm always so nervous about saying like coming up with these random observations, because I'm like, please, I hope like you take this the right way. But (laughs) because to me, it's an absolute delight. But it's sort of that Alice in Wonderland sort of experience of just like, okay, what's behind this door? And if I open it, open this up, is it this big, vast environment? Or do I myself go down really small and experience this? Like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I've never read that but I've seen the the drawings and it looks like really the first surrealism (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah I like that good (laughs) yeah Yeah, the book is definitely I mean I think most people are familiar with Alice in Wonderland obviously from from the Disney version of it but the yeah the book is actually really beautiful in that sense that it, it is definitely a surrealist experience to to read that book and especially as always like a book you can use your own imagination and your and you create the own world as opposed to someone creating it for you. But it feels like, right. yeah. you know, like that's part of the experience with your work. So we, oh, darn it. We only have a few minutes left. <laughs> oh, my, it's gone fast. <laughs> I know. I just looked at the clock. I was like, wait a minute. That's not fair. <laughs> but I'm kind of curious, what are you working on right now? Or what are you currently obsessed with in Normally, what I would say is what's what's on your easel right now or what's going on in your studio. But I think your answer, like there has to be a different way to ask you that question. <laughs> I'm working on a small triptych now, not maybe about 19 inches by 14 by four thick. And I'm just about done with the carving and I'm starting to gesso the panels for that. And I have a a full scale. I do full scale, do a thumbnail and then a full scale drawing on graph paper so I can take measurements off of it so I can get just to get the right amount of wood and cut properly. So I have a full scale drawing of a, another triptych that I have on the wall. But I have in the back of my mind that I'm cooking, I'd like to do something that has to do metaphorically with vegetables. Really? Yeah. The round forms of a tomato is just like I'm really attracted to that. And the part of the apple where the stem goes mm-hmm. in, that dipping down in there, I, I just I just have a hankering to like carve that and do something with that, but make it metaphorical. Oh, wow. That's down the road. Yeah, know? I imagine. So oh. <laughs> I have 10 questions in my head right now. Just like on a practical note, I'm really curious. What is your studio like? I'm guessing you must have two separate studios, one for the woodwork and the carving and another for painting, or am I totally off? Well, I used to have that, but I have now the painting and the wood all in one place and my office in a different place outside the, in a, another room in the house. Why did you change that? Just Oh, because I got evicted. <laughs> <laughs> I got evicted from my studio and had to find a place that was uh, a substitute, somebody that would, I'm renting and that would take a messy artist. So that was away from the city center near the hills, which turned out great because I started to see the colors in the sky that I couldn't see from in the city. And I, and it all turned out wonderful, but I have it all in one space now. Oh, wow. Which is, yeah, 
Yeah, because just you have to take what you can get in the Bay Area. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you in San Francisco or San Jose still? San Jose. Okay. Yeah, but still. Yeah, this is a really nice, really good landlord. He's really patient and obliging. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do you find it difficult to have them both in the same place, or has that turned out to be an advantage? Oh, it's it's kind of an advantage because then I can coordinate. I can do that simultaneous thinking of ahead Mm -hmm. with them right there next to each other instead of having to carry it and take it to another location to do the next step. So it's, it's working out. Great. That's so cool. So my last question, I haven't asked this one in a very long time, but I'd, I'd love to hear your answer on this. What is your dream project? If there was no restriction on time or money, what would you create? What I'd like to do is I'd like to take a tour of castles and cathedrals in Europe and sit there and draw and take pictures and then do a body of work that would be exhibited either in a church or in a forest. Interesting. And I can see the parallel between those two, actually. <laughs> yeah. thought, wow, that's great. I thought nobody's going to get this. You know, but no, because I mean, like in, in the cathedrals and stuff, like they really, the whole architecture and everything is just reaching up towards the heavens, so to speak, right? Yeah. There's yeah. a figurative and literal design of that. And I can, yeah, and a forest is the same to me. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, it's it's my my sacred space, the forest. Yeah. I can see that. Holly, it has been just an absolute delight to talk to you. I'm so fascinated. And now I have to find a way to see your work in person. <laughs> okay. Well, there, there's a, I have one piece that's on exhibit now in New York and one down in a museum show in Thousand Oaks. Really? In Thousand Oaks? Yeah. William Roland Fine Art Gallery and the campus of Cal Lutheran. It's in a group show, in a, a really nut, wonderful group show. I'm so honored to be showing with the other artists in that group show. It's on the theme of how contemporary artists respond to the idea of Arcadia. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's like Odd Near Drum and uh, David Laguerre. And they even have a attributed to Nicholas Poussin in that show. Wow. Yeah, and... Uh, some of the names are just skipping my mind right now. Stephanie Peak and really great show down there. Yeah, it's a traveling museum show. Okay. And how long is it up in, in Thousand Oaks? In April. Okay. Sometime in April. Okay. Yeah. And just because people listen to this, like these t- people tend to listen to the podcast, like kind of years later, we're talking April 2017, okay. just 20. so that nobody like me would just get in the car and drive down to Thousand Oaks to see this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it opened in February, going to, I think, the end of April in 2017. Okay. And then you have, did you say you have work at the Forum in New York? Yeah, the Forum Gallery recently moved from the Crown Building to 4, 475 Park at 57th. And they've been in business 55 years, so they have a, a group show up to inaugurate their new space. And so I have a piece in there, yet yeah, like a Forum Gallery celebrates 55 years of modern and contemporary art. Yeah, my little piece is hanging next to a John Singer Sargent drawing. (laughs) (laughs) How how does that make you feel? (laughs) Oh, I'm just like, please, this punch, you know, about about that. (laughs) Wow. Talk about good company, huh? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Congratulations. That's fantastic. They have so many good artists in that gallery. I'm so pleased to be showing there. Fantastic. Holly, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight to talk with you. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and yourself with us. Well, thank you so much. This has been really a pleasant experience. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast. I want to give a big thank you to Holly for sharing her insights and for being so generous with her time and knowledge. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab to see the show notes for this episode. You can see some of the pieces that we talked about, including Fortuna's first assignment, plus get links to all of the other artists that we talked about in this episode. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. 
If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.